thank you all for being here. Thank you, Balthasar, um, for being here. I will give a short introduction and then we can start with your keynote. Um, so Balthasar Bickel holds the chair of general linguistics at the Department of Comparative Language Science at the University of Zurich. He got his graduate training in the Cognitive Anthropology Group at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics and received his PhD from the University of Zurich. After postdocs in Mainz and Berkeley and an assistant professorship in Zurich, he became a professor of ling linguistic typology at the University of Leipzig in 2002. And then he moved to Zurich in 2011. In 2020, uh, he became, became the director of Switzerland's National Center of Competence in Research, Evolving Language. He has published several articles in distinguished journals. Uh, just last week, Balthasar and his colleagues published an article on exploring correlations in genetic and cultural variation across language families in Northeast Asia in the Journal of Science Advances. He has done extensive fieldwork and on a number of Kiranti languages of Nepal. The first talk I heard from uh, Balthazar was in 2017 at the Stutz, which is a student's conference for linguistics, uh, where he gave an engaging talk about constraints on linguistic diversity as a window on human evolution. So today I'm very much looking forward to his talk. Uh, about his recent work and on the topic of nature and culture in language evolution. So, Baitaza, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for this kind introduction. And indeed, thank you uh, for having me here. And thank you, everybody, for uh, taking the time and uh, listening to this presentation. Now, uh, many commentators have observed that obviously language is both the product, product of um, cultural evolution over historical time, leading to the great diversity of languages that we have now, and also the product of biological evolution over geological time, creating what is essentially a single language capacity, a single faculty of language uh, shared uh, in, the, in the species as a whole. Now, saying this is easy, but uh, taking apart the two components uh, telling which parts of language, which properties of language are due to culture evolution and which parts of language are due to biological evolution is not easy. It's actually extremely challenging. And um, if you uh, look at uh, just the distribution of some property, if you look at the map like this, linguists have been quick to assert what is cultural and what is natural. So for instance, in this map, you see the distribution of languages that put the verb at the beginning, that's the red dots, and those that don't do that, that's the red and purple ones, or the purple ones are actually mixed. Uh, now, looking at distributions like this, linguists in the past have been quick to say, oh, well, here it's clear, right? One type dominates, uh, so maybe that's or probably that's the natural type. That's maybe what our brain prefers uh, because of how it evolved biologically. And indeed, there is even some plausible story to that uh, because, for instance, in quick, in, uh, quick exchange and conversation, uh, it's hard to plan verb initial sentences because you have to plan everything right from the start. And so maybe there is a disadvantage to that. And so this explains why the red dots are less common than the blue dots. But it's just as plausible to say that, well, no, actually what we see here is the result of cultural evolution, of historical events, very specific ones. For instance, in Africa, we had the Bantu spreads. And maybe before the Bantu spreads, there was all red, it was all verb initial. Maybe the nilotic type of verb initial dominated. In Eurasia, the same, maybe before the spread of um, Indo-European and Austroasiatic and Sino-Tibetan, it was all red. Maybe it was all verb initial. And what we see here is just like a, a, a change in, in history because of specific events like agriculture, domestication of other stuff, uh, uh, conquests, uh, uh, migrations, and, and so on and so forth. How do we know? We can't tell just from looking at this map. Nobody will be able to tell. And 
I don't know what's the right answer. I want to raise a challenge. I want to say this is unclear. Here is the opposite. If you look at the map like this, linguists have been quick to say, oh, here we have a clear case of that the distribution of languages is the result of cultural evolution of historical events, because obviously we have the Bantu spreads that made everything red. And so SVO, oh, we had language contact in Europe since the Middle Ages. So clearly it's all red now there. And the SVO, that's subject, verb, object, the verb in the middle, Southeast Asia, Volumes have been written about language contact in historical times. It's concrete historical events that shape the distribution. And so linguists have been quick to say here, this is a case for culture. But how do we know? It might be the other way around. And indeed, there are theories around about our brains, about how our brain processes information, linguistic information among it, that would say, well, for the brain, it's actually better to have or the brain pre preserves naturally to have structures where you minimize the length of dependencies in sentences. So if you have the verb in the middle, you have exactly the same length of dependency to the subject and the verb uh, and the object. But when you put the verb at the end, it's harder because you have an extra long dependency between subject and verb, and there is the object in the middle. And even from a purely computational point of view, that's really harder because you need to have the object in check. You need to store it in the middle right before you get uh, uh, you resolve the, the dependencies. So the a case has been made that maybe SVO is preferred. Now, in that case, Clearly, this is a case of a biological factor driving the distribution of linguistic structures and not cultural. Again, we don't know. And the point of these two examples is that uh, we can't make quick inferences uh, as we have done in linguistics, uh, just by looking at types, their distributions, and then interpreting them post hoc and come up with a story that fits the distributions. Now, what I've been proposing for the past few years is that we indeed should wait, move away uh, from counting types in linguistics, from uh, and then interpreting these types and interpreting these um, uh, these uh, distributions and come up with a story that fits it more or less and should move to directly studying the specific natural and cultural conditions and mechanisms that cause biases in how languages change, that drive the distribution of languages and their types over time, over historical time. And uh, is, this is what I call evolutionary biases. That's just a term. The key point, however, is that we really need to start from trying to understand the specific mechanisms rather than trying to interpret the world. And what I want to do in this uh, talk today, I want to share um, a series of case studies uh, that we have been engaged in in, in my lab over the past uh, a few years, uh, making cases for uh, plausible cases, potential cases, this is all ongoing research, nothing is fixed here, uh, but uh, plausible cases for where we, I think we, can say uh, here clearly it's it's cultural conditions uh, and, uh, and and cultural mechanisms that shaped how languages evolved over time and in and in the case studies where we can say that well there is a plausible case for a biological condition of our brain specifically uh, that shaped uh, the uh, uh, evolution of languages. Uh, I want to start with the case study on um, cultural evolution. Okay, so first I want to start with the case for culture. And um, how, how can we do this? How can we look at this? Um, clearly, where we have historical evidence that's relatively easy in Europe, but that maybe is also the least interesting ones because it's so limited. And so what we want to do is look at conditions of historical events that shape the distribution of linguistic properties over deeper time. And uh, the uh, one of the uh, roads that lead there is obviously population genetics, which allows us to reconstruct population history. And this is what we did in this um, recent uh, case study uh, that Annika mentioned that just came out uh, last week. Um, where we looked at uh, languages from Northeast Asia. We picked this area because it shows great diversity in terms of uh, you know, language isolates, but also languages that are related, great diversity in the kinds of linguistic structures we find that, but more importantly, we also had the data, we have the genetic data, we actually we generated new genetic data um, in order to reconstruct the population history in the area, and we're able to match this genetic data with uh, linguistic data on 
um, uh, the lexicon, uh, the, I mean the, the, the base lexicon, the one that you also use for historical reconstructions, then the um, uh, phon phonological patterns and grammatical patterns. And also, interestingly, thanks to Pat Savage, who joined the team, where we had uh, music data available for these. So we could also test whether maybe population history also had an effect on, on the distribution of musical structures. And um, what we did then uh, is compare the, the distances between these uh, different types of data. That's not an easy uh, thing to do because you have lots of, uh, you know, autocorrelations going on. It's also these are uh, the, the spatial distributions of the data is quite challenging because you have some with small areas, some languages with larger areas. And uh, we came up with a, with a new pipeline of analysis based on redundancy analysis. And what, they discover, what we discovered is that intriguingly, the only correlation that uh, was robust and, and also robust after controlling for the current location of languages, that is spatial autocorrelation, and after controlling for cases of historical inheritance because languages are related, once you control for that, the only correlation that uh, uh, stays is the one between grammar and genetics. So it seems like the genetic distances reflecting the population history leave a trace in the distribution of grammatical patterns. Now, what's interesting about this case study, uh, I find, is that this is holds between language families. In the past, mostly when people have correlated genes and languages, they did this within the language family. Here we did it between language families. And if you discover correlations between population uh, history and, and genetic distances uh, and, and grammatical distances, this, this case now suggests that this, uh, because it holds between language families, it must have arisen before the formulation, formation of these families, right? It's, it's, a, it's a signal that goes above and beyond the individual families and the individual isolates in this case. It's, it's, a, it's a signal of, of uh, uh, a mixture, we, we suspect, we can tell a mixture between shared inheritance in families for which we have no other evidence now, certainly not lexical evidence, because the lexicon does not correlate with the genetic distances, does not correlate with the population history, or contact in prehistoric time. Again, contact in prehistoric time, independent of current contact possibilities, because uh, we controlled for the current uh, spatial distances and uh, the uh, correlation uh, stays in this significant um, uh, independently of the current locations. So this opens a window to uh, a time before the formulation, formation of current families as detectable as we usually do through lexical comparisons to cognacy. Now, the reason this is important is that because it suggests that maybe also in other parts of the world or maybe even globally, grammar might pick up signals again, mixed between unknown ancestry and contact uh, uh, that are older than what we see uh, in current language families. And this actually uh, gives new light and revives, in a way, a hypothesis that uh, uh, Joanna Nichols has proposed over 30 years ago, uh, where she proposed that the population history that underlies the peopling of the Pacific and the Americas uh, far before the formation of current language families, that this history, this deep time history, still leaves traces in the distribution of grammatical features, uh, linguistic properties today. And uh, a couple of months ago, we published, in fact, a paper that uh, tested this very specific hypothesis on the distribution of one very intriguing property of languages, that's the expression of possession, where we found that the distribution of a very special, a bit exotic type, as you might want to call it, uh, indeed traces uh, this vast area of the uh, around the Pacific. You find it uh, it, all over the Americas, you find it in uh, insular Southeast Asia, uh, you find it fairly commonly in Austronesian, that's the triangles in the, in the plot, but also we discovered this in Ainu. Uh, 
an isolate uh, north of Japan and the north of Japan. And this traces, again, this distribution. Now, here we don't have strong evidence, but given the plausibility from our case study on Northeast Asia, that deep time genetic relationships, deep time population history can leave traces today in the distribution of features. It is certainly plausible that the distribution here was caused also by a deep time population history, in this case, the history of how the Americas were settled. And um, the pattern, so for the linguists among you, the pattern uh, that is of interest here is that uh, in these languages, uh, there is body parts, you can possess them directly, and kinship terms, uh, just so-called uh, inalienables, you can possess them directly by attaching a prefix to them, so my eye or your head in, in these two languages. But when it comes to other terms, you cannot do that directly. You have to use a special word, uh, a possessive word, a classifier, a verb, uh, a whole series of uh, options here. Uh, so do you possess it indirectly? So for the dog, you cannot uh, just say my dog in Ainu, you have to say my, and then this element dog. And, and in Kajiwe, it's, uh, you have to say you, this element river, in order to say it's your river. Okay, that's just the, uh, the pattern here. So uh, could this be true now? Could this be indeed be, could we see a reflex of the population history around the Pacific in the distribution of uh, uh, grammatical features today? Um, if we uh, look at the distribution of individual uh, traits um, and, and, and aggregate them, and this is uh, then we might see something. And this is what I did here. This is work in progress. I picked here uh, the proportion of the presence of features in language families as we know them. Now, in isolates, it's an operator, it's one or zero. Uh, but I picked these distributions and did a PCA on that. And, uh, and then colored the first the first three PCs in uh, color space so that similar colors mean similar uh, values, mean similar properties. And what you see here is, again, something that re is reminiscent of the circum-Pacific distributions with the blue shadings that you get in uh, New Guinea and in Southeast Asia, in the Americas, in Ainu, obviously, and uh, in Nif along the coast here in Northeast Asia. You also find in Yenisei and in the Caucasus, that sort of outliers, but uh, uh, probably reflecting a very interesting uh, historical event, but I don't want to speculate on this. Um, what the point is that how can we test this more formally? Again, this is uh, still preliminary, but um, uh, one of the things we can do is to uh, look at uh, we can measure actually biases in how languages, language families in this area evolved as opposed to how they evolve elsewhere in the world, and then look at the distribution of these biases. For language families, that's a relatively straightforward thing to do. Um, you, you take the distribution of the data, you take the trees, and then you fit your standard phylogenetic models and that can tell you whether or not there is a preference in the history of these families for one or the other types. Call it biased, uh, or we call it preferred. And so you have a, here, uh, for instance, a pr preference for the red state or not biased, where it's just equal rates of change in both directions, uh, doesn't deliver a signal, there's no trend here. Uh, for isolates, it's more difficult, uh, and in, in this preliminary study, we just did some extrapolations, so we resampled isolates, assuming that an isolate is the sole survivor of a no longer traceable language family, and asked, would that reflect a family that had a bias or didn't have a bias, and we assume that it would have a bias in proportion to the amount of biases we find in large families. Now, whether or not that's right or not, I don't know, but certain simulation studies that we did on that, that we did for this uh, showed that it delivers a relatively good signal. Um, so if you simulate the data, uh, the distributions, you can recover it by, by, by this method. We're working on an improved version of this, but here is a quick initial result. And the quick initial result tells us that, uh, at least for grammar, uh, we find about 30 properties that are like the ones, the one that we saw, like this possessive uh, construction type, that show a significant difference in the biases of individual families 
between the Circum Pacific area and the rest of the world. This comes with false discovery rates because you do multiple testing all, all the way around. And what you see on the slide is that the false discovery rate goes even up to 20%. So there is not many features left that show a signal, but they are left. And that's the point, right? We don't expect huge numbers of uh, features to preserve such an ancient signal, but even discovering a handful is kind of intriguing uh, if it is robust. So this needs more testing. I don't know whether it stands the test of time, but I wanted to, to present this as a, as a case for uh, how we can study starting from population history, in one case, in the case study that we just published, where we know the genetics in, in close detail, and in the other case, where we have a large suspicion on the, on the population history, and when we can, where we can see how these population histories caused, uh, literally caused the distribution of linguistic properties as we see it now. So this is the first case study I wanted to present, a case for cultural evolution explaining uh, the distribution of linguistic properties. Now, I quickly open the... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you elaborate on what you mean by musical structure? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, this is really not so much my turf, much more uh, uh, Pat's, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's based on cantometrics, uh, which is a coding of uh, musical uh, of music in terms of their structure and styles and, and so on. Uh, and it's, it's a large database um, that's been around and that's been uh, uh, kind of uh, renovated and remodeled uh, recently. And that's what we, what we took here. So it's traditional music essentially. And uh, we, we took this because originally in, in an earlier paper, Pat found interesting correlations between that and uh, population history, but inside one language family. And so here now the signal dissipates if you do it at the deeper time scale, where you have different language families that are not related with each other, uh, or not everybody is related with each other, and you control for those cases where it is related, then the, the, there is no signal uh, left. The only signal that we found is grammar. All right. Um, and then can you elaborate what you mean about isolates? Yeah, so the isolates, the, the problem is with uh, reconstructing and estimating um, cultural evolution in language uh, is that uh, you can do that only if you have, you, you can compare if you have uh, several languages that are related, but in isolates, they have no relatives. So Basque, for instance, is an isolate or Ainu is an isolate. And uh, the idea is that isolates are the sole survivors of, uh, they must have come from somewhere. They were not just kind of uh, up over in or innovations by some speakers. They must have come from somewhere. So they must have had relatives, just we don't know them. And the idea is we try to estimate what was behind the evolution of that unknown family based on what we know of the state of the isolate, what type it has, and based of our prior expectations of a family being biased, biased or not. So it's basically a, a Bayesian way of approaching the problem, but combining a prior with some data and coming up with a posterior inference. All right, thanks for these questions. Um, let's now move on though to the, to the other uh, case studies. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, here was a, a case for plausibility for uh, cultural factors. And now I wanna make a case for the opposite of something where I think the distribution, or where I think we have evidence that the distribution of linguistic properties today ref reflects uh, fairly directly the working of uh, a property in our brains that is the result of a biological evolution. Um, for this, we need to start obviously not with language, but with our brains and how they perceive the world, how they function, how they work. And I want to start this by going back to the uh, late 40s when uh, Alex Michaud published this uh, wonderful uh, breakthrough studies on the perception of causality or the perception of agency, you can also say. And the discovery was that, and this has been replicated many times, uh, it's, it's really robust. The discovery was that humans have an amazing uh, uh, propensity or human brains have an amazing propensity 
to perceive agency and to detect agency whenever, wherever there is even the slightest evidence for it, to really even impose agency. And uh, this is found even with young infants, infants from three months old uh, onwards. Uh, when you show them pictures like this, this is from a very recent replication studies of this whole tradition, where you have a block moving towards a round thing, moving towards it, and then that moves away. You perceive this as the block causing the round thing to move away, right? The, 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 square, the square block uh, is the agent that does something and then it moves away. You cannot not perceive this. You do this involuntarily, automatically, and even as an infant, as a pre-linguistic infant, you do that. They have greater looking times when, it, when, it, when it's not happening, right? Uh, when, when something is uh, uh, kind of moving and then stops, doesn't contact, has no contact, and then that thing starts. So there is no clear agency involved, no clear direct causation, then they are puzzled and look longer. Uh, or if you show them displays of uh, like dots moving around in space uh, randomly, as opposed to when it looks like one is chasing the other, right? Again, agency is perceived. So this is very robust, but more interestingly, this is not just humans. This is also with uh, chimpanzees. Unfortunately, up to now, there is only one uh, study on that. Uh, we are currently uh, doing more experiments with, uh, uh, with uh, all three uh, great apes, uh, species right now, uh, but the results aren't out yet. Uh, so as to complete the picture here, but the initial finding that is there in the literature is that uh, uh, chimpanzees also have this agency detection bias, just like humans. So for instance, if you show them uh, one of these classical experiments here, where in one condition, someone grabs uh, a doll and moves it away, as opposed to someone moves the hand towards that item and that that item disappears spontaneously. So there is no causal relationship between the two. There is no agency, it's just two independent events. Then again, you get exactly the same picture as we get or same results as we got with the, as we get with the infants and uh, chimpanzees have longer looking times when it becomes not, when you move from causal agency related to non-causal, non-agency related. Then it's something weird. They, 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 they don't, uh, they look at it longer. They are a bit puzzled, why? Right? Because it's not natural. Right? The, the natural is that it perceives seem to perceive agencies just like we do. Actually, it's even more interesting. It's not just our other primates. Uh, it's also uh, chicken. So really far away in the tree of life. Um, and it was an interesting study uh, a few years ago where they uh, took freshly hatched chicken, imprinted them on two different items, different colors, different shapes, A and B. They would be presented in random movements uh, and they uh, got uh, sort of trained on them, imprinted on them. And then they were shown an event, again, where you have causality where you have an agent, like the ones that depicted here, A moves towards B and pushes B away. Right, so you have this agency story, and then they presented the the, the, the chicks uh, a choice: where do you want to go to, to A or B? Which one do you like better? And the chicks predominantly moved to the one that was the agent in this picture, right? The one that moves. So they seem to like the agent better, or whatever it was, they preferred the agent, and this seems to be related to this agency detector that we have in primates. And that starts pre-linguistically still in humans. So it's a deep-seated thing that must have arisen uh, at least within the amniotes, probably even before that. I suspect it's much older, is a very, very primitive notion that uh, uh, it has evolved biologically and that still shapes our brains. Why do I talk about this? Because there is a case to be made that this matters for language. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, uh, no, maybe before that, I should also say that uh, the effect that we have here is, is extremely rapid. Uh, so if you look at what happens with adults, human adults, the, you perceive these, the, the agent uh, uh, very, very quickly. And this becomes apparent when you perform what's called brief exposure experiments. It is flash subjects, a stimulus video or picture, still picture usually, uh, of an event, just like the one here, the woman kind of uh, hitting the guy there. 
uh, you flash this only 40 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds. That's, that's so fast you can't even think, right? That's it's extremely fast, just like a, a blink of an eye, right? It, it's exactly a blink of an eye. It's just really very short. And even after such a short presentation, subjects are amazing in recognizing who was the agent. They're very bad at recognizing who was the patient. And we replicated this, in fact, Arate, a PhD student in my lab, replicated this in an experiment with Basque and Spanish speakers. We did two languages because we wanted to know, well, maybe there, this still is influenced by the language we speak. Maybe there are differences. Yes, there are, they are interesting. But beyond this difference, in both languages, for all the subjects, there is a clear preference for the agent again, right? So the, in, in this very brief exposure, they look at the agent more, that's gaze fixation. They have an easier time recognizing the agent than the patient. And they are much better at describing after the experiment, the, the, uh, the agent, for instance, saying what color of shirt uh, the, the agent uh, uh, wore in the experiment. Now, why is this interesting for language? Because uh, you can think of language comprehension, right? also as just another way of perceiving the world, just like looking at um, a picture or um, looking at the uh, emotion scene that's played to you in an experiment. It's just also just a perception event. And so uh, we, we, we did studies or started to, uh, a whole train of, of studies on language comprehension, which is also you know, a perception uh, experiment. Uh, and uh, we compared, for instance, here in Chinese uh, stimuli of the following kind, we had uh, a noun phrase with no further marking. So by itself, it's completely ambiguous. Novel or actor could be an agent or could be a patient. You have no idea when you just hear it on its own. And then the sentence ends in this experiment is very brief with a verb that tells you whether this initial uh, noun was an agent or a patient. In the first one, novel understood, it must have been a patient. That's the only way the sentence makes sense. In the second one, the red one, it must have been an agent, the actor understood something. And in the third one, the novel educated, again, the novel did something, that's the agent. So red and green are agents, blue is patients. We measured at the point of the verb, understood, we measured the electrophysiology. And we found when presenting the blue stimulus, so when the first noun turns out to be a patient at the position of the verb, we found what's called an N400 effect. An N400 is an effect that you can trigger in, with linguistic data whenever some expectation is disappointed, right? When something doesn't match up, that's when you get disappointed in you. You're surprised by what you what you what you would expect. Something that isn't right. And here, novel understood. One way of interpreting this is that that's what we propose in the paper. That novel uh, understood here. When you get to the verb, you're surprised that this is actually a patient because you expected it to be an agent, just like in the other conditions. But now it turns out to be a patient. Now. If this is true, then one could claim that this preference, this bias towards quickly, ultra quickly uh, attributing an agent to something, quickly perceiving an agent, imposing an agent, this, you know, the perception of causality, as Michel called it, the perception, right, very low level, quickly uh, and, and fast, um, that this is something that would also uh, drive how we comprehend sentences. And we really get then uh, thrown off if, it, if, the, if this prediction of an agent is disappointed and we have this effect. Now, uh, this study has its problems because the sequence novel and understood is not canonical in Chinese. So there could be other reasons why uh, we had this N400 effect in this case. So we turn to other languages and we turn to specifically Hindi. And Hindi is interesting because in Hindi, <coughs> um, the uh, uh, a noun without the case marker typically is a patient, right? It's the normal thing to have. It's a, it's a patient. That's what you see in the example, the book here. And we did an experiment where we contrasted this case, uh, book in the nominative, unmarked, with uh, another condition where this is marked with an accusative. The accusative case tells you this is a patient. This must be a patient. So there should not be any surprise. 
Now, <clears throat> if the book in the blue condition, if the book also typically is a patient, you shouldn't see a difference here because in both cases, well, you can say speakers will, perceivers will just expect this to be a patient, but no, in the blue condition, we again found this N400 effect, which seemed to suggest that it's the same that we found in Chinese. In fact, it's the same that we found in many other languages. We find this, been, this study has been done in lots of European languages. Uh, German, English, and so forth, and it's always the same. You find this effect, the N400. It seems that even here, even though it's totally normal for this initial noun without further case marking, unmarked, nominative, it's totally normal for that to be a patient, yet still it seems that the brain suspects this to be an agent and then is sort of disappointed when it isn't, and then as a reflex of this disappointment, you get this N400 effect. Now, don't take my word for when I say this is normal to be a patient. In fact, it is. If you look at corpus uh, distributions of the nouns that we use in the stimuli or of any noun, unmarked nouns, in the, so the left hand is the, the stimulus, the stimuli that we used in the experiment. On the right hand side, you get estimates for all the nouns we find in the corpus, corpus and stimulus data don't match nicely, but still, what you find is that whether you look at unmarked nouns, as nominative nouns, anywhere in the sentence, whether you look at them initially only, doesn't matter. In all cases, the, in Hindi, the probability of such a noun to be a patient is much higher than to be an agent. So really, speakers who came into the experiment booth expected these things to be patients. There should not be a surprise when they are patients. Yet there was. Also, uh, it is... Uh, uh, the probability after these nouns for a verb to be transitive is much higher than to be intransitive, so they expect this to be transitive, and yes, it was transitive, so that cannot explain the, uh, the effect that we found. Um, uh, now, uh, this is the Hindi, one can object to Hindi, well, but look, there are these case markers that maybe uh, reshape the system and so forth, uh, so, uh, and certainly don't trust the single replication study, so we went further, we replicated, in fact, Sebastian Saupe, a postdoc in my lab, went to the Solomon Islands together with also a NASA specialist on Iowa, and uh, ran a similar experiment with speakers of this language. This language is particularly interesting because the patient initial order is sort of the base order. It's clearly the most frequent order. It is uh, privileged syntactically. You can say this is like a, a bona fide object initial language, a patient initial language, goes exactly against what the brain suspects, right? The brain would suspect the first noun to be an agent, yet here it's typically a patient. Again, the data from the corpus performed that humans, animates, inanimates in all three cases, uh, for an initial noun phrase, uh, what you uh, expect is it's a, a, it's a patient and not an agent, um, just like in Hindi. Now, what we found in this language is really interesting. In the human condition, when you look at uh, human noun phrases in, that are initial, then you get again the same N400 effect that we found in, in Hindi, that we found in Chinese, in German, and, and so forth. You get uh, an N400 when it turns out that this element is a patient. Now, this is really strange, right? Because the language, the grammar of the language and the frequency distributions, again, tell very clearly the first noun phrase should be a patient, and yet the brain seems to be surprised when this is, in fact, the case. Now, we suspect that this really shows the presence of this agent detection preference that we find in other animals, right? It's still there as a principle of perceiving the world, here perceiving a sentence stimulus that is presented to you. Now, also interestingly, the effect disappears, actually get reversed when we turn to non-human reference, you know, uh, names of animals or uh, inanimate things like table. In Hindi, we had this with inanimates. We still had the effect. In Iowa, it goes away. What we think, how uh, we interpret this is that the, the experience of the language and the cultural evolution of the grammar that this language has, the historical developments can reshape the brain and the brain adapts to that, at least for animates and inanimates, but not for humans. So that's kind of the pièce de résistance, that the last thing standing that just holds up where the biological preference for agents stays, that's with human reference. That, that's our uh, hypothesis. 
is like the, 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 the thing that uh, really shows the continued presence of this biologically evolved trait of preferring Asians, just like chicken. Now, what does this all mean? Uh, a consequence of this is that it predicts actually a bias, an evolutionary bias towards languages with unmarked initial agents. That should be the preferred state. But now this is not the post hoc generalization, not the post hoc uh, idea. It's something that we can derive from a principle for which we have the biology. We know what's going on in the brain here. But then we can test the prediction. And so this is what we did a few years ago. We looked again at the distribution of biases, evolutionary biases within language families aggregated them all over the globe, split by different areas, so as to control for recent language contact. And we found that, yes, there is a very strong preference. Uh, uh, languages prefer to evolve towards a state where they have unmarked agents. Uh, and when they have that state, they prefer to stay in that state, uh, and as opposed to evolving towards marked agents or staying in that uh, state. Uh, you can see this in close detail if you do uh, the same reconstructions in individual families. For instance, here in Indo-Iranian, we find that, well, things have gone back and forth in this family between marked and unmarked agents, but overall the preference clearly was for unmarked agents and uh, Hindi and along with it a few others are the exceptions and certainly not what uh, dominated uh, the past of the, of the, uh, his, of the family's history. Uh, as, a, as far as in, this is about the unmarked agents being preferred, as far as the initial position is concerned, uh, you can look at, uh, this is clearly reflected in the worldwide distribution, uh, languages with agents before patients are far more common, and, uh, and if you do um, probabilistic reconstructions of these trends in one family, this is work by uh, Ying Ji Jing, a PhD student in our lab, uh, you find that, again, there is an evolutionary bias towards placing agents before patients. This is particularly interesting in this case, this study, because it's based on corpus data, not on grammar data. This is based on, on large amounts of, of actual language use, such as reconstructing language use rather than just grammar. But you see there is a strong preference towards agents and patients. Now, I, with this, I want to conclude this, uh, uh, this case study. Uh, oh, I'm doing time, yes. Uh, and uh, the, the upshot is that we have a, a clear case where some pattern in the, that evolved in our brains here, the detection of agents as the first thing you do quickly, unconsciously, that has an impact on how language has changed over time. So a case for nature. Now there's a few questions on this case study before we lose, move to the last one, which is a, a shorter one, but just to round up. Uh, let me go through the questions. Um, am I right to conclude that the patient is an object? Uh, not necessarily. We here uh, use agent and patient in a strictly semantic sense. So we take the patient to be that argument that um, uh, is semantically a patient. Now, usually that's the object, but in a passive sentence, it would be the subject. Uh, Next question, can you see the difference in the active versus passive voice in, in the experiment looking at detriment? Yes, uh, nice follow up. Uh, yes, actually there's a paper out by um, uh, Sebastian Saupe, uh, uh, we mentioned together with Monique Flecken uh, in cognition, uh, where they did exactly that experiment and showed that the agent preference can be modulated, it can be reduced in passives, but you can't get rid of it completely. That's a very interesting case. It goes exactly together with what I showed from uh, the experiment in brief exposure that uh, Arate, uh, um, Isas, Isas Mendy uh, did in our lab. Um, brain signal, next question. Brain signals are observed irrespective of the proficiency of the language. Uh, yeah, these are all mother tongue speakers in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in wherever we do this. I mean, people speak second languages, obviously, but, um, and sometimes this is a bit tricky. So in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the study on Hindi, it, uh, it was, we, we had to make sure that people really had Hindi as their first language uh, and were absolutely uh, mother tongue speakers. But yes, that's an important point.
uh, next question, would an interpretation of the human non-human difference along the animacy hierarchy also be reasonable? So they would expect agency for humans, even though it is fronted. Uh, yes, no, absolutely. This is an effect of the animacy hierarchy. You could say it's just, uh, whether it's a hierarchy, I don't know. It's, it's just a binary distinction, essentially human versus non-humans in Iowa, uh, because we don't find, there's no systematic difference between higher uh, between animates like animals and and inanimates, there's no difference there. So it's it's not so much a hierarchy, but just a binary distinction. Uh, yeah, definitely, it seems to be something that uh, is robust, as I said, specifically with human reference. So we, uh, uh, you, a language and the experience to the grammar that has culturally evolved can overturn your kind of natural expectations for. Uh, animal names and inanimate reference, but not for humans. And uh, follow up on this in the same way. How clear is the difference between non-human and inanimate? I have questions of, yes, it, no. <laughs> yes, exactly, there's no difference. Yeah. Um, or at least, I mean, uh, no difference. It's, uh, saying something isn't there is statistically obviously always hard, but uh, uh, clearly it's it's very, on a very different scale than the different. You, you saw it when you go from, uh, uh, when you go from um, here, from humans to animates, you have a flip, right? So here, the, the brain is surprised when it turns out to be a patient, right? Um, and when it turns out to be uh, an agent, right? So the brain expects, that's the, the red line. And so the brain seems to expect patient, right? In the, in the animal name condition. Okay, so uh, let me, well, what did you mean by tendency to have unmarked A? Uh, tendency to have unmarked A in the languages of the mark means that you have a bare noun that has no case marker on it. Uh, that is just because that fits exactly what the brain expects. It expects an agent anyway. So no, no need to mark it, right? It's just, it's just there because you expect it to be an agent uh, anyway. So it's the, uh, to, to, to put it briefly, it just says like, it's the um, it's a natural pattern in the languages of the world, but by nature now I mean something very specific. I mean something that follows how the brain evolved in its perception of reality. Okay, now let's move on to the uh, last. I'll skip over this um, thing here briefly. I want to wrap this up uh, with the following. Now, we, we started with a case study where I made a case for cultural evolution, historical events having shaped um, the distribution of linguistic features here, population history, as you recall. Then we uh, looked at the study where there is a case for biological evolution, how we evolved as just one animal among many others towards a brain that has this preference for agents and how this shaped the distribution of languages. And now I want to close this up by a study that brings both together because there is a case to be made here for cultural evolution changing something in nature and then nature changing something in the cultural evolution of languages. And so we start here uh, first with nature and then see what, what changed. Now, uh, if you look what happens with primates of any kind, monkeys, apes, humans, what happens with their bites during the lifespan is the following. You start out with what's called an overbite. So the upper incisors are a bit in front of the lower teeth. It's on the left-hand side here. And over time, during your first uh, 15 or 20 years of age, your bite gets exposed to tough work, mastication, you know, chewing, hard stuff and so on. And across all these species, you get the natural development that you at some age, between 15 or 20 years, you get to a so-called edge to edge bite, where the two positions, uh, the two teeth align. This, is, um, this has mechanic reasons that are well understood uh, uh, biologically and have to do with abrasion, with the uh, compensatory effects uh, and, and so forth uh, that happen in, uh, during this period. Nothing genetic here, it's just like a natural mecha mecha mechanistic effect on how our bites develop. 
enters agriculture, and this is what we did in a study that came out two years ago, enters agriculture. Agriculture, of course, you know that changed pretty much everything uh, in the world, but one of the things it changed is also the kinds of foods we have at, uh, at our disposition. You have milled food, you have grinding, you have fermented foods, you need to store it, right, and to make it pr preservable and so on. Uh, the upshot is that food, more and more people had access to softened food, to food that is just a gruel or something, a porridge or something that needs less uh, chewing, uh, mastication that is just uh, much easier to eat. And the result of this is that, and this has been studied before us, is that uh, the, uh, this natural process of developing from an overbite to an edge-to-edge -edge bite stopped. And we now, as, agri as, as consumers of agriculturally on food, or even more today of pre-processed food at great scales, we preserve the initial overbite uh, that we start out with. We don't have this to edge to edge development anymore among agriculturalists and certainly about everybody from industri industrial societies. In fact, it has gone so far as it's become an aesthetical ideal. And the picture I put there on the right is from an ad from a dentist that says, well, if you have edge to edge bite, then come here, I will correct it for you with braces. Because it's now perceived as the best thing. It's completely unnatural, right? It's, it's completely new. It arose with agriculture, but now everybody loves it and hates edge to edge bite. Anyway, that's a side remark. What matters more for us uh, on language is that this has a plausible effect. This change, so we have a natural development that got stopped with agriculture. So a cultural innovation stopped the natural process and it has a change, an effect on culture. In order to look at this, we did biomechanical, biomechanical modeling of what it means for a, for a, a mouse uh, to produce uh, certain sounds under the overbite and the edge-to-edge -edge condition. On the left-hand side, you find the overbite, and it's called overbite and overjet officially condition. On the right-hand side, you find the edge-to-edge -edge bite condition. And we looked at the production of sounds like P and F, bilabials and uh, labidentals. What you find is that first, under the overbite uh, conditions, it's much easier to produce an F um, than under the edge-to-edge -edge, uh, condition. Uh, it takes more effort, more muscle effort. But that's not even the most important point. The most important point is that if you look at the distance between teeth and the lower lip, you find that it's virtually the same in the, between P and F in the overbite and overjet condition on the left-hand side. The tooth lip distance is virtually indistinguishable between a P and an F. In the edge-to-edge -edge condition, it's very different. Right? There's a clear difference in the, in the position. Clearly, it has to be. It's just pure mechanics. The consequence of this is that linguists uh, among you might recognize it. There were languages that changed P to F. And Grimm's law, one of the most famous laws in the history of Indo-European, but much else, obviously, is exactly uh, what's at stake here. And so we looked at Indo-European uh, traced cognates, uh, cognate sounds that have labidental f or similar v reflexes in at least one uh, language in the tree. So cognate sets like the word for foot, where in some languages it turned this p turned to f. I uh, did this for all these different correspondence classes, did phylogenetic modeling on this. And what we found is that indeed an increase in the probability of languages in the European family to have labidental sounds, Fs, which means that this change to F seems to have been facilitated over time. It's become more common, more probable. The time frame is roughly compatible with the spread of agriculture in the sense that agricultural goods became more and more available to more people speaking uh, in European languages and within these populations to more and more sectors of the population. It became cheaper, more widely available. And certainly with the int introduction of industrial milling in antiquity, it became all over common to get access to, to, to uh, finely grained uh, 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 
uh, uh, items, um, wheat and so on, and uh, you could have softer food. And also another prediction of this worldwide, we would expect that uh, agriculturalist uh, societies in general have a higher probability for labidental sounds than hunter-gatherers, which have less, not no, but less access to softened food than uh, agricultural communities. And this is what we found. We found a strong effect in the study uh, that uh, 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 hunter-gatherers have far less uh, labor dental sounds than food producers. So this is a case here where we start with a natural development of our bites that got changed through a cultural innovation, agriculture, that in turn had an impact on the cultural evolution of languages, because now we produce more uh, labidentals and the probability of that became uh, higher. The critical point is that this is not a post hoc inference on the distribution, but it's based on the mechanistic understanding of the, 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 the change events, the language change events here, the how you change from a P to a F, and we say, well, this is because they are articulated in pretty much the same position. Uh, and so uh, they can be quickly mispronounced or just as important, misheard, because we know that in language change, the perception of the hearer is actually uh, one of the key drivers of change. Anyway, this is what uh, I wanted to share with you all, the, the three case studies. Let me wrap up just by a few words uh, of conclusion. I think we, we can now, in linguistics move beyond uh, this interpretative tradition that we have had in historical linguistics and uh, also in linguistic typology, where we look at distribution, distributions of types and the nature of these types and, and uh, formulate stories that could plausibly explain them because we can actually now really uh, move towards specific mechanisms in what I see is like an emerging field of what we could call evolutionary language science, where we bring all the, the evidence from all these different disciplines, from population genetics uh, as a window of, of uh, prehistory to, to the biomechanics of our bites, to the, the uh, neurobiological evolution of our brains, bring this all together and study what impact it left on languages. And so this really brings a, a new prospect, I think, for uh, being able to disentangle finally uh, the biological, natural, and the historical, cultural conditions of language evolution. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you very much for your attention.